Taffer Barry Minfer was born on February 16, 1983. He was one of those fortunate people blessed with the intangible mix of characteristics and qualities that made him extraordinary. Setting aside for a moment that he was 6'7 tall and an incredible athlete, Taffer was intelligent, loyal, charming, handsome, self hour thoughtful, kind, inspiring and big-hearted, nevertheless humble. Incredibly, even endowed with all of those qualities, Taffer's singular and most remarkable quality is his ability to make the people in his life feel cared for, to feel special and important. In other words, Taffer Berryman, at a young age, had the ability to be present. He practiced mindfulness organically, before it became part of popular culture. Fortunately, because of his ability to be present, to pay attention with purpose, he imprinted himself on those he interacted with, leaving them with strong and powerful memories of him which, given his far too short life, is a gift to those who loved him. In the early morning hours of April 3, 2005, the lives of two young men, 20-year-old Jamie Rivera and 22-year-old Taffer Berryman tragically intersected. The chance encounter between strangers devastated two families. Incomparably, Taffer's family would lose their son, an innocent college senior on the brink of the rest of his life. Rivera's actions were the product of fecund misunderstanding, clouded by alcohol and narcotics, warped logic, and misguided loyalty. Because of what he did, Jamie set his life on a collision course. Racked with guilt, he engaged in relentless self-destruction through drug dependence. Then, 12 years later, he was caught. His incarceration separated him from his son, who was born in the wake of this tragedy, was 10 years old when his father was arrested, and will be a grown man when he is released. Jamie Rivera endured a challenging childhood and early adolescence. Born to a teenage mother and older father who separated when he was an infant, Jamie was raised by his grandparents in the Tilden Housing Projects in Brownsville, Brooklyn, at the height of the late 1980s to early 1990s crack epidemic. Brownsville struggled. Crime was rampant. Thieves frequently robbed his grandfather, who taught young Jamie that he had learned to keep only a little money in his pocket and the rest in his sock to minimize his losses. People in the neighborhood were always getting shot. Once, he came home from school to find that someone had shot through his bedroom window. Gun violence and carrying a gun for protection was a way of life necessary for survival. Inside the apartment, though, Jamie's grandparents provided him a loving home. As a young boy, they raised him in the Pentecostal church. Though they lacked financial resources, they provided Jamie with love and stability. That all changed when Jamie was 11 years old, and his mother took him back to live with her and his younger brother in a basement apartment in Bushwick, Brooklyn. The neighborhood was challenging, and so was their relationship. His mother was an NYPD police officer, and she brought the job home. Rather than work to ameliorate his feelings of abandonment from the formative years of his childhood, his mother turned to corporal punishment. Instead of feeling love, he felt policed. His mother commonly remarked, if you want to act like a perp, I'm going to treat you like a perp. When he was a teenager, she moved the family to Freeport, Long Island. Their relationship continued to deteriorate. At 16 years old, Jamie left home and filed emancipation papers in the local court. Predictably, he soon dropped out of high school. Attempting to cope with the upheaval of his very young life, Jamie self-medicated with drugs and alcohol. In the ninth grade, his drinking and marijuana use began to escalate. When he left home at 16, he first tried and quickly developed a dependence on cocaine. Social use on weekends became daily use. Sooner or later, teenage Jamie fell into the clutches of the Latin Kings. He had been aware of the gang since he was a kid in Bushwick, where they held a stronghold in the city. Jamie had a distinct memory of a handball court on Knickerbocker Avenue that would constantly be riddled with graffiti and repainted by the city, over and again. The Latin Kings painted a crown on it, and it was never tagged again. That power entranced Jamie and stayed with him when he moved to Freeport. He believed the ideology of the group to unite, protect, and advance Latino people across cultures was positive, before it transformed into something negative. Jamie's best friend introduced him to a local tribe leader. They were placed on probation and then crowned as members, years prior to the murder. He never held a leadership position. The gang became Jamie's family. They filled the void left when he left home. They offered security, loyalty, and financial stability. The values shared by the gang members were sacred. A threat to one of them was a threat to all of them. They protected each other. On the night of the murder, Jamie perceived a deadly threat to a man he considered family, and he was inclined to act as family members do. 
On April 2, 2005, Jamie Rivera joined his friends at La Mansion, a nightclub in Long Beach. Nothing about the evening was extraordinary. Surveillance video from inside of the club shows a crowded club, packed with young people socializing, dancing, and drinking. Jamie was drinking at the bar, talking with friends, he was not engaged in acts of violence, not committing any crimes, not dressed in any gang apparel, or making any kind of gang-involved motions. Jamie and his friends at the club were members of the Latin Kings, but they were there that night for the same reasons as any other young people. To enjoy themselves and each other. Taffer Berryman and his friends, CW Post College students, were there for the same reasons. Both groups spent hours at the club, staying past 4 a.m. At closing time, the ordinary night took on a completely different tenor. As the patrons left the club, fueled by hours of intoxication, fights began to break out amongst the mostly Hispanic Latin kings and a group of mostly black young men, including some CW Post students. Jamie was not involved in any of the fights, neither inside nor outside the club. It became a melee. As he walked towards his car, Jamie saw one of the black men shoot a gun in the direction of one of his dearest friends, missing him. Around the same time, someone broke a bottle over the head of Taffer's best friend. It was chaos. As Jamie drove away, just blocks from the club, he approached a stoplight. Pulled over on the side of the road, were Taffer and his injured friend. The friend had been attempting to drive home, but could not see because of the blood dripping from his forehead. He had pulled over, and Taffer had switched into the driver's seat. The friend was standing outside the passenger side of the vehicle, waiting for Taffer to unlock the door. As Jamie approached the car, he believed that he had encountered the men prior, when one of them had attempted to shoot his close friend and mentor within the Latin Kings. Filled with rage and fear, intoxicated by drugs and alcohol, and with the bravado, vengeance, and lack of judgment of an adolescent, he acted. From the driver's seat, he fired two shots into the pulled-over car. One of the bullets entered Taffer's arm, then his chest, killing him. His senseless decision ended an innocent man's life, and destroyed his own. The moment that Jamie realized that Taffer Berryman was dead, it consumed him. He turned to the gang for help. They could not sincerely provide what Jamie needed any more than they had prior to April 3, 2005. His drug addiction spiraled. From cocaine, he began to use angel dust. He began abusing all manner of pills Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycontin, Roxycodin, Oxymorphone and when he could not find enough pills to fulfill his habit, he turned to heroin. Heroin addiction tightened its grip on him, unshakable by several attempts at drug treatment. By the time he was eventually found and arrested, he had sustained a severe addiction for over a decade. On the other hand, Jamie attempted to live a parallel coexisting life, trying to build a career and a family. Very soon after the shooting, he and his then-partner conceived a son, who was born on Valentine's Day, 2006. Without even a high school degree, albeit with high intelligence and social intelligence, Jamie attempted to forge careers in banking and in sales. At the time of the offense, he was working as a business banker. He recalls going to work just hours after committing the offense. Due to his depression, anxiety, and drug use, he frequently changed jobs. He moved into commission-based jobs in the insurance sales industry and attempted to start his own agency. Around the time of his arrest, he had been selling and exporting cars at two car dealerships. One was located close to the scene of La Mansion. Driving past the intersection of the offense every day consumed him, he left the position. Jamie's drug addiction, propelled by the guilt and shame of carrying around his hidden secret, destroyed his jobs and relationships. He hid what he had done from his family of origin and his romantic partners. He was arrested for petty drug, theft, and driving offenses. Over and again, he attempted to enter drug treatment and counseling, it never took hold. Drugs were Jamie's outlet for drowning his guilt. Redemption was simply not possible while he carried this secret, and neither was a successful life. Twelve years after the offense, Jamie was finally arrested. For the first time in his life, he would spend significant time in custody. Locked up for two years, Jamie finally had the clarity of mind to make peace with the demons that had haunted him since 2005. He could finally exhale and commit himself to an effort to make amends and to start fresh. As he writes in a letter addressed to Taffer's mother, I am responsible for your pain and your family's pain. I am truly sorry. I will spend the rest of my life trying to make up for what I did to you, your son and your family.